This video will explain an interesting approach to applying data augmentation on text data for natural language processing applications. I think the most interesting part about this paper is the way the authors define data augmentation and use it to motivate their experiments. The authors view data augmentation as forming local neighborhoods around the available data points. So in order to add further structure to these local neighborhood constructions, the augmented example is contrasted against a MoCo style memory bank containing the encodings of the rest of the data set. So it has this local consistency as well as the global consistency that enforces the augmented pair to be a local neighbor to the original instance and add structure in this idea of having this manifold that connects these points as you form these local regions around each individual point. The algorithm itself gives a 2.2% boost to the Roberto Large uh, model evaluated on the GLUE benchmark, but I think this is just scratching the surface with this idea of local and global losses for data augmentation, and hopefully this video convinces you of the same. This video will explain CODA, Contrast Enhanced and Diversity Promoting Data Augmentation for Natural Language Understanding. So before diving into the details of this paper, here are the primary research questions that are explored and motivate this study. So I'm going to paraphrase these. These are exactly how they're worded in the paper itself. The first of which is trying to find different data augmentations that can be applied to text data. The second of which is trying to see how we can stack these augmentations together. So say we first apply back translation, then we apply random swapping, or we then apply adversarial augmentation, or some kind of chain of applying these augmentations to each individual example to have many more ways of uh, forming these augmented examples. And the third uh, research question that's a pretty interesting idea and novel to this paper is trying to find a data augmentation framework that has local neighborhood augmentations as well as a global consistency loss. The high level idea of the paper is to explore these two different uh, mechanisms. The first of which is how we can stack together text data augmentation. So say you want to uh, apply back translation where you take this text sequence, translate it to German and then back to English, and then you want to apply adversarial augmentation onto that already augmented example. So we're going to look at some different ways to stack together these augmentations and chain them together, particularly for text data and natural language processing. The other key idea is this global consistency loss as well as a local consistency loss. So it's common to use these frameworks like contrastive learning and uh, unsupervised data augmentation where you take an original instance in your data set, x sub i, form the augmented uh, pair through something like this and then you have x sub i prime and now you're gonna have some local consistency loss between these two examples where you want your model to be consistent with its prediction on the original example and the augmented example. So now the new idea is to also have this global consistency loss. So not only do you want this new uh, example to be uh, consistent with the original example, you also want it to be dissimilar from the momentum Q of the other data points that you have uh, experienced in your training. So this is cementing the author's view of data augmentation as constructing local neighborhoods around data instances and then particularly enforcing this local neighborhood idea by having this global loss comparing the augmented example with all the other examples in the data set and then you could also include other augmented examples in the data set for forming this uh, global uh, regularization of negative pairs in this uh, joint embedding space of learning these consistencies between embeddings of augmented pairs and original data instances as well as all the other data in the data set. So let's backtrack and motivate this idea of why we need further exploration into data augmentation and why what's been developed for computer vision can't just be adapted off the shelf for natural language processing. So the first of which is designing label preserving transformations for text is harder. So this is uh, kind of like the basic, this is like the equivalent of rotation and translation horizontal flipping in computer vision that's used in text. This paper titled Easy Data Augmentation Techniques for Boosting Performance on Text Classification Tasks. And this introduces four different key augmentations for text. We have synonym replacement, random insertion, random swapping, and random deletion. So you can see how, uh, you know, e using these augmentations, they're not as guaranteed to preserve the label of the text. Say you have IMDB movie review sentiment, and you randomly delete some keywords that display the emotion of the movie review. It's harder for these transformations to be label preserving compared to the image augmentations like rotations that you can't really rotate a cat so that it becomes a dog. And that's kind of the idea of label preserving transformations. And then the next idea is how can we combine these data augmentations? So as we do something like randomly deleting, randomly inserting, as we chain these together, we can quickly uh, construct a completely different text sequence than our original example. This is different from images where you have things like this is the auto augment policy, and you can easily chain together shearing X, inverting, shearing X, solarizing, auto contrast. You can just easily stack together these data augmentations. But for natural language processing, we're going to need a more clever algorithm in order to chain these together. 
So here's a quick visualization of this idea, and uh, diagram C is the only thing you really need to be interested in. This is this idea of sequential stacking where we apply transformation one and then transformation two in sequence to form X prime. But we also have random combination where we randomly select one of our augmentations, say we have back translation, uh, conditional BERT, and then random swapping, we just randomly select one to form an augmented example, and then mix up interpolation is where you take these two uh, text sequences, and you're gonna randomly uh, average them together to form the new augmented example. But this diagram here of sequential stacking this is the key idea that we're focused on in this paper. As we unpack the CODA algorithm, let's take a second to deconstruct this definition the authors provide about data augmentation to get a better sense of how the algorithm is working and the intuition that's guiding the authors of the paper. So they define data augmentation as data augmentation can be regarded as constructing the neighborhoods around a training instance that preserve the ground truth label. So I thought this picture from On the Measure of Intelligence by Francois Chalet is a great illustration of this concept. So we have each of these individual data instances in our uh, training set. They lie as these points on some data manifold, and we're trying to construct this local neighborhood around each point. So our function doesn't have this super high variance to exactly model uh, this data. If you've seen one of these uh, canonical examples of overfitting where you have some high degree polynomial that just exactly bends around to model the data, rather we want to have this, this uh, coverage of the space. And instead of doing this directly by regularizing our model, we're going to do it in the data space itself. So we're trying to occupy a bigger region around these data points to have this um, higher information conversion ratio as we cover a bigger space as described in On the Measure of Intelligence. And we're trying to do this in the data space by constructing these local neighborhoods with our data augmentation. And this is done by having these two loss functions, the local consistency between these uh, new points around the original sample. And now we're also gonna introduce the new idea in CODA, which is a global consistency. So we're gonna make sure that the new augmented sample lies around this neighborhood and isn't just uh, another point in the data manifold by having a global consistency loss with each augmentation derived from the original sample shown as the dark blue dot in this uh, diagram from On the Measure of Intelligence. So the way these neighborhoods are constructed is by having these two loss functions. We have a local consistency and then a global consistency with each uh, xi, xi prime. xi prime is our augmented example. yi is the label. You might uh, have your consistency loss be based on uh, the representation directly, say the intermediate embedding vector of xi and xi prime, or it could be about the target distribution on y sub i, and you can also use the ground truth label for enforcing this consistency and adding more structure to this loss function. And then we have our global contrastive loss where uh, capital M is the memory bank of previously encoded examples from the global space of the data points that lie on this manifold, as we're also looking at the dissimilarity between points interpolated around, say, this point and this point when we're constructing a neighbor for this point. So this is the key insight from this paper that I thought was really interesting in that existing approaches for data augmentation and consistency regularization particularly only examine a pair of original and augmented samples in isolation. This is describing things like unsupervised data augmentation, more so than these contrastive learning frameworks, which really haven't quite made their way to text yet. There are some interesting papers out that I'll link to in the description of this video, but it's still a new idea of applying this uh, contrastive learning to text data and natural language processing. So they often just augment these examples without considering the other examples in the training set. And then the consequence is that uh, this new example isn't going to have this local neighborhood property. It could just form an augmented example that could say be this point here. So rather that we're going to try to enforce that it's just a local neighborhood around this individual point with our data augmentation. And I think this is a really interesting idea for if you take this perspective of viewing data augmentation as trying to blow up these neighborhoods around your data points to connect this data manifold and have a big uh, area of understanding your data. So I think the motivation behind the algorithm is pretty clear by now, so now let's get into some of the different text data augmentations that are explored in this paper. So the first of which is pretty famous, it's back translation. Back translation is where you translate from, say, English to German and then back to English, or you do whatever language. And this is also commonly done by using a neural machine translation model. So you'd have another off-the-shelf model that's trained to do neural machine translation, and this gets plugged into your, uh, into your training loop as an inference machine for data augmentation. So the next of which is conditional BERT word replacement. So BERT is trained to, you mask out a token and it fills out the mask token with a predicted uh, word or word token. Conditional BERT is about conditioning on the classes. So similar to say the conditional GAN, you're gonna introduce an embedding vector for the class label so that when BERT is filling out this mask token, it's consistent with the, or it's been trained on the class label. So BERT will know that it's filling out a positive movie review or a negative movie review before it just uh, fills out that mask. And 
you know, it's interesting to think about how that might generalize to these other problems like natural language inference or question answering and so on. But it's definitely easy to think about what this means in text classification, maybe harder for other natural language processing problems. So then cutoff is similar to this idea of uh, cut out in image data, where we're just randomly uh, taking away these different tokens and just applying a random uh, zero mass to them in some window. Mix up is the idea of taking two different text sequences and just smashing them together, averaging out the either in the embedding space or you could do it in the input space, although that would be really noisy. It's probably more common to do it in the embedding space. And you just do that by taking the two embedding vectors, weighting them by this alpha parameter to average them together and form a new embedding vector. And then adversarial training is kind of the hero of the story. It's the uh, one of the most interesting ideas for augmenting data in natural language processing. And this is where you have an auxiliary controller that's trying to find a noise mass to add to the embedding of the original text sequence to cause a misclassification, or it could be directly trying to cause an inconsistency with the representation of E sub i and E sub i prime. So you don't have to just be doing an adversarial attack on the output label distribution. It can also be on the intermediate embedding vectors, and that's another way of doing uh, forming these adversarial examples. So the next key concept to understand before we get into the experimental results is this MOCO algorithm for forming, the, forming this um, loss with the global consistency. So the way this works is we have our momentum encoder of all of the other examples in our data set that forms this queue of the intermediate embeddings. So this is done to save memory with large batch sizes for contrastive learning. Say in papers like SimCLR, you'd have a gigantic batch size of the negative examples compared to this where you have this momentum queue so that you just have this uh, data structure of previously encoded embeddings compared to the high dimensional inputs. And the other detail of this is the momentum encoder is a running average of the same neural network that is being used to encode Xi and, X, uh, and Xi prime. And the idea is that the momentum encoder is a running average of the parameters. So say you have hyperparameters like 0 0.99, 0 0.99. This is describing how much you update the moment, the um, the Q encoder parameters with respect to the latest uh, update of the encoder. And the gradients are only flowing this way through the encodings of the query. In our case, we have Xi and Xi prime, and not just one single query that we're comparing with the Q. So we're, we have this uh, consistency between the the original example and the augmented example with all the other examples that we've seen and encoded into this queue that we sample from and then have our loss function for global consistency. Again, with this idea of trying to construct local neighborhoods to make sure these two are similar to each other, as well as this new augmented example being dissimilar in the representation space from these other examples. This data augmentation framework is evaluated on the GLUE benchmark. The GLUE benchmark is this collection of 10 different natural language processing tasks, or actually I think shown in this table is about eight tasks, I thought it was 10, maybe there are two that are missing from this table. But the GLUE benchmark is one of the most popular baselines for natural language processing. It mostly consists of pairwise classification with things like natural language inference uh, or paraphrase like detecting duplicate questions where you take as input two different questions or two different uh, phrasings of a text sequence and then you classify if it's a paraphrase or not as well as semantic text similarity and then natural language inference where you have hypothesis premises premise and then you see if the premise is, the premise of the hypothesis is entailment contradiction or neutral and then you have text classification so uh, quickly I think what's important to note before we look into the uh, results of data augmentation is the number of training examples so in natural language inference you have 393,000 examples same thing with core question pairs and then also for this uh, sentiment classification, text classification problem, whereas in other problems you have as little as 2.5 thousand or 3.7 thousand, and data augmentation particularly is for solving this problem of learning from limited labeled data, or at least that's where we're seeing the most gains and the most uh, application of this is in the setting where you say only have you know 2,000 labeled examples, but you still want to use deep learning, that's where you'll look to something like data augmentation. And so I do think when you look at the results of this, it's important to note that um, the data sets with less data are gonna benefit more from these kind of algorithms. This first results table is what happens before we bring in the global consistency regularization or the local consistency regularization. This is just showing the result of applying these transformations for data augmentation. So first we're looking at these different transformations as described, back translation, conditional BERT, cutoff, mix up, and adversarial attacking compared to the original Roberta baseline on the MNLI uh, natural language inference data set. Then we see the performance gains by stacking together the transformations. And as originally stated, the you know the motivation of our paper we don't get much of a gain by stacking these together we see the best score is achieved with 88.8 .8, but generally it performs about the same as you chain these together with things like uh, stacking or where you're doing mix-up where you 
uh, do back translation and then average out the embeddings or do back translation then an adversarial attack and then average out those intermediate embeddings of the augmented text sample and the original text sample or random as we have these random pathways for selecting one of these transformations for combining them together to form a controller of selecting these data augmentations. So then the next interesting thing about this table is this MMD distance metric between the augmented example and the original example. So we see when we apply conditional BERT to our original text sequence, it hardly changes it from what it originally was, similarly to our cutoff augmentation. And this is probably, it looks to me like looking, just reading these scores, it seems like MMD is probably some kind of uh, just alignment score. So we probably just align the, the two text sequences and then every time there is a mismatch, you have uh, you add to the score. So kind of like hamming distance with uh, genetic sequence alignment if you've seen something like that. So it's interesting to see that when you stack them together, you see a much higher uh, corruption of the original example, even though you know maybe this metric isn't the best for reporting, but just to get a quick sense of how much we're changing the original example as we form these new augmented pairs. So putting together the local and global consistency losses, these are the results of the CODA algorithm on the GLUE benchmark. So we see some gains over the standard Roberta model, only applying back translation or cutoff, as well as these more uh, clever ways of applying adversarial augmentation. I imagine that these have a more, I didn't read any of these papers, but I imagine they have uh, a more complicated scheme of constructing these adversarial examples compared to uh, what's used in CODA because of the way that they uh, have three different ways of describing adversarial training. So overall, we see a gain, a, a significant gain of about 0.5% uh, on the average of the GLUE benchmarks. But then probably most interestingly, again, is to look at the data sets with the least amount of data, which is RTE, MRPC, and then the SDSB. But it, it's also hard to say this because these are pairwise classification tasks where it's probably even harder to define these data augmentations, but we see an RTE where we had uh, the least examples, we see the biggest gain, and then the same idea, if I can remember this again, with the, uh, the SST data set, I think it was SSTB only had 7,000 examples, and again, we see the biggest gain. So either way, you see that, particularly it's highlighted in this RTE thing where we see, uh, well, either way, but we do see some interesting gains from applying this algorithm. It's not really mind-blowing gains, but it's still an interesting idea and probably one that could be explored further. So probably aside from the table comparing CODA with all these other ways of doing data augmentation and these other adversarial attacking uh, augmentation examples, this plot probably sells the idea the best. This is the performance without the contrastive global loss compared to with the contrastive loss doing back translation, cutoff, adversarial augmentation, and then stacking them all together. So we see this significant gain of about, well, 0.3%, but on this one particular natural language inference data set, but we see this consistent gain of adding in this global loss. And then they go on to ablate these other hyperparameters of the momentum encoder as you're updating the neural network running averages. The temperature is a hyperparameter on the distribution of the labels, and then the memory bank size, exactly how many of these previously encoded examples we keep in the queue. And then overall, we have an ablation on uh, using MoCo or maybe supervised contrastive learning or this particular framework that is uh, put together in this paper. So a couple of different ways of thinking about how to structure this contrastive loss. So here are some more results that are promising, although not completely uh, game changing in deep learning. But in the space of learning from limited labeled data, where we have only say 20% of the original training data set size, or uh, yeah, something like that, I think it's even like 2% of the data, we see these gains as we have less labeled data, and that's the motivation of using data augmentation. But again, it's not like the red curve is completely up and to the left, but it does show a decent improvement, and I do think it's a really interesting idea that could be expanded further. So I wanna end the presentation of this paper by talking about this idea of defining data augmentation as constructing neighborhoods around the training examples. And this is kind of what drew me to this paper and made me wanna make a video about this. I think this is a pretty interesting way of thinking about data augmentation. And again, going back to the diagram of on the measure of intelligence, it aligns with that kind of view of forming these uh, regions around each of our data points that connect them together and then help enable uh, generalization and you know greater intelligence. So I think that although it's interesting, it does kind of undersell data augmentation because we have more power than just uh, going around a single data point, and particularly things like generative models that can be trained on the entire data set and then augment that way, those can learn from the entire data set to uh, derive these new examples. So I think one interesting extension to this paper that could build on it further and there another paper I want to present later on is titled uh, model patching that's also in this ICLR 2021 catalog is about taking subsets of the data and forming augmentations from them. So maybe we could form these subsets and then have the same kind of local global consistency thing 
but using more of our available data to infer the parameters for uh, forming this new augmented example. So rather than just using a single point, we can kind of collect these uh, similar features between a subset of the data and then form a new example from that. So I think it's an interesting idea that could be uh, extended onto this idea. And I don't think that augmentation should only be derived from single examples of the data. I think we can use more about the data set that we have because even though the challenge is learning from limited label data, it's not like we're learning from say 50 examples. We still usually have more than that. So this is just some final thoughts on this concept of thinking about data augmentation as constructing neighborhoods around the training example. And I hope from watching this video, that's kind of the key thing that you're thinking about with respect to what data augmentation is and how it's useful. Thank you so much for watching this video explaining contrast enhanced and diversity promoting data augmentation. I hope this video was useful for you if you're dealing with this frustration of trying to learn from limited label data or overall curious about data augmentation and how it's being applied in natural language processing. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos. Mm -hmm.